poker is start, Tom? How did you do it? Um, well, I played with uh, some some uh, folks back in the early 70s, Sonny Fortune, uh, Weldon Irvine, uh, Dr. Lonnie Smith, uh, a fine organist, and uh, just really followed their lead. Uh, uh, they, they were very, very fine band leaders that were able to, you know, convey the message of what, of what their music was about, and I was, uh, I was just digging it, really. Uh, so right place, right time again. Uh, to, to, to pick up what was going on. Well, no, Bing died, didn't he? He, he did. Yeah. He did, rather tragically. Yeah, actually. tragically. Yeah. yeah. yeah he, had, uh, he had quite a following over here, from what I understand. Yeah. Well, he helped um, try Cool Quest. Mm -hmm. Mm hmm Yeah. Very interesting guy. Yeah. Yeah. Weldon was responsible for just about every young musician that came out of Jamaica, New York. Really? Uh, Donald Blackman, Bernard Wright. Donald Blackman. Yeah. Bernard, uh, Marcus Miller. All, we all came through Weldon. Really? Yeah. Cool. Yep. Well, he was kind of intellectual. I mean, he's an intellectual regarding music, wasn't he? Mm -hmm. In some ways, mm -hmm. you know, the way he, uh, even the way he titled his albums and titled tracks, they seem to be quite Afrocentric. Mm -hmm. So, you were with Lonnie Smith as well. How was it to work with you, Lonnie Smith? Uh, well, uh, Lonnie had, uh, I think he had a hit out called "Move Your Hands." And uh, Lonnie Lon Smith, the the organist, yeah. not, not Lonnie Smith. Mm -hmm. uh, it was great. It was great. Uh, uh, Lonnie actually was my first tie-in to the record deal that I had with GRP. Lonnie Smith and, and Earl Clue. Lonnie was working at a club that I happened to frequent in New York uh, called Breeze and Lounge. And uh, my first manager ran the club and also was manager to Lonnie at the time. Right. And uh, so it was, just a, it was just a good connection, but he was, he was great to work with. And GRP was part of Warner Brothers, wasn't it? Uh, GRP was part of Arista. They were actually Arista. actually uh, funded and distributed on Arista at the time. Right, right. Yeah. And uh, how was it to make the first album? How was it to work on that? Interesting. Uh, it, 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 I can look back with you know fond thoughts on it. At the time that I signed with with Dave Bruce and Larry Rosen on GRP, I didn't. I, I felt comfortable as a bebop trumpet player, but I didn't really have a direction in terms of. You know, pop fusion, yeah. jazz music. Uh, Dave Bruce is great to work with. Yeah. Uh, he's he's one of the producers, like Quincy Jones or uh, Bob James, folks like that. That can hear an artist, not necessarily try to change what they're doing, but find a way to shape them into a music that'll work, as opposed to a producer who just says, "No, I want you to abandon what you do and play this." Yeah. You know, so it, it's it's very good to be with a person like that that uh, doesn't is not to necessarily change you and redefine you, but just yeah. to kind of gently guide you. Yeah, uh, so to try so, and reshape you. Right. Or, yeah. Right. So, I, so I, Dave, I Dave is a pleasure to work, and he's a fine. I mean, he's written so many movie scores, and right, yeah. uh, he's done everything. He did mountain dance. Mountain dance. And, and, yeah. yeah. You know, when you got you had the success of um, Funkin' for Jamaica. How did that feel? Did you? Did you yeah, how did you feel about that? Nobody yes. expected it. The label didn't expect it. Um, we, we had the LP 95% done. And uh, Arista just mentioned, eh, it feels like it just needs one more track. Yeah. And uh, so I, I wrote, I remember writing the basic structure of the song in my attic, my parents' attic. Um, and uh, got in the studio, showed Bernard the bass line, and he said, oh, I dig it. And, uh, we just built it up from there, and when we handed it in, the reaction that we got from Arison was like, oh, okay, you know, no, no one really thought much of it. GRP right. just said, oh, okay, it's a, you know, we'll do it, it's cool. Yeah. It was like a throw together tune. Nobody was anticipating the reaction that it got. Um, I, I, I don't know if there was anything necessarily like that out there in the market at the time that just, that just had that, you know, spacious bass line and that kind of... So it was a blessing. And then we were talking about Shaka early. Yeah. Uh, Shaka, at that particular point in time, didn't have a record out. It was right in between her products. Right. And Tony Smith, the vocalist on Jamaica Funk, yeah. uh, just happened to help me put this thing together. And it dropped at the right time, right place, again. Um, and the rest was history. So people thought, in many cases, that was Shaka. Everybody Khan. thought that was Shaka Khan. Myself. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Everyone thought it was Shaka. Yeah. Amazing. So, uh, mm. You still come to London a lot, still mm. perform in London with other musicians as well. So mm. you, 
you've quite a, got quite a big tie to the UK. You know, what are your thoughts about the UK scene as you come over here? Uh, the UK is, for me, uh, the mainstay of the jazz musicians of my era, yeah. uh, our career. Uh, because we used to have a situa situation in the States, you know, 70s and 80s, where radio meant if it's a good song, we'll play it. Yeah. Okay? Uh, and so you could hear the Commodores right behind the Beatles, yeah. right after Grover Washington, you know, and, and the music would, you know, right, and George Benson, and then just track the track the track, and it would flow. Because as long as it made pop, funk, jazz, commercial sense, yeah. they'd play it. Uh, and of course, you know how it is now. It's very pigeonholed and narrow. And uh, But Europe, and specifically London, has always been versatile that way. I mean, it's always been open to good, just good music. Yeah. And... Uh, and so, you know, even with the kids, I noticed, okay, there's new stuff out, but they're into retro. They're into this whole, you know, 70s and 80s sound. They like the sounds. They want to know. And so, you, really, you guys have kept the music alive. Yeah. Uh, we appreciate it. Mm. And I'm sure you have a lot of young fans who come, who are new to the music, and they come to the music it's yep. very often. So, how did you both yeah. come together to, uh, to work, to go on this tour? How did you join forces? Let's uh, Joyce and I? Yeah. Uh, we played. Was it that bad? <laughs> was my playing that bad? <laughs> Jeez, she's laughing at uh, Didn't say that. <laughs> we played um, a festival in, in uh, the Netherlands called the Delft Jazz Festival, which a gentleman named George Ankihang, who's a producer over there, jazz, uh, a festival producer, mm -hmm. uh, put together. Um, he his his policy was to come to the states, find artists that would work uh, in in his vision, yeah. and uh, so once a year he would bring uh, artists over. I think he's doing that again this year with some very fine artists. Uh, and uh, it just so happened that I had done a video for Holland uh, on the history of Jamaica funk because it's it's very it's still very popular over there. Yeah. And uh, once this film ran. Uh, there was such feedback about it that he just saw the viability of getting me involved in this, this festival as well. And uh, Joyce was one of the uh, vocalists that was uh, subsequently selected to be the uh, part of this whole thing and mm -hmm. it's worked out, worked out well. It's amazing what you can do, I mean, you can be so creative with uh, music. Mm -hmm. you know, there's so many different styles out there, mm -hmm. you can't say there's or you can create your own. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's not a lack of choice. Mm. And I guess, I guess that's the point. I mean, maybe not not to change the name, but even if you took the name jazz out of it, the whole yeah. concept is just be free and improvise. Yeah. You know, and you can do that in anything. You, know? right. you can do that in any form of music. And it was actually jazz that taught people how to be free mm -hmm. and improvise. Yeah. Mm -hmm. exactly. and you didn't have it otherwise before that. Mm -hmm. Not unless you go back to Moorish music, maybe, mm -hmm. which is the foundation of classical music, mm -hmm. but um, what I would say also is that uh, Amit Jamal, for example, he calls this music American classical music, he mm -hmm. doesn't like to call it jazz. Right, right. Or Yusuf Latif, who just passed, mm -hmm. he, he didn't call his music jazz, he didn't like that word. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And understandably, yeah. Uh, yeah. you know, there's, there's, there's a history there, and, and, and that's... <laughs> yeah. here, here, we, here we go into the political area again, right. yeah, but that's what this whole movement to make sure that the heritage is passed on yeah. is about because it is American classical music specifically is African American classical music right. uh, and it's 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 very important you know as we play these gigs you know the way I do gigs with Roy and, and uh, 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 Ronnie Laws and so on one of the things we do is make sure to tell the people pass pass the word and pass the heritage along to your kids because yeah. uh, they they are the sustainers of this music yeah, they really are. Definitely, definitely. Yeah. If they uh, if they not if they don't know about it, it dies. Yeah, yeah. yeah. The politics in the states. Oh, there we go. <laughs> Off my note. You have time. <laughs> um, I I believe. Okay, well, st starting from Mr. Obama uh, yeah. and Lord Never, I I believe he came into office, obviously by popular vote. And I believe he had 
a vision that politics aren't as dirty as they really are. Uh, I, I believe he had a, had a goal to try to get a lot of things done and has run into a lot of opposition. He didn't uh, realize it was mud wrestling. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Uh, George and I were just talking the other day. Every other civilized nation on the face of the earth has the concept that if you're a member of this, a, a citizen of this country, you should have health coverage. It's just a common uh, sense. Yeah, I mean, you know, life, liberty. Well, part of life is health coverage. Yeah. I, I think we are the only nation that will tie health coverage in with your ability to pay for it. Yeah. And thus, you know, if you're not as fortunate to have a great income to be able to buy, then you just have to suffer with your... And, and that's... What else you become. That's ludicrous. Yeah, of course. You know, and, and so his proposal uh, was met with such opposition as though it was a foreign, almost, a, you know, a communist concept. Yeah, the Reds are coming. Yeah. Um, that says a lot about us. Yeah. It says a lot about us, you know. It, it shows the separation of people that shows where the intent of people's heart is and yeah. uh, it's 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 unfortunate it is really yeah because and also it does what it does i think the, the worst thing it does is that it reveals to people around the world who always thought that you know they believe the second world war that this country is saving the world mm -hmm. and, you know this superman and in red white and blue stripes uh, well, if you're not taking care about your own people how are you going to do it for us yeah, yeah. In, in, in your own home first you know, is, yeah. is what it, and one thing I really do appreciate him for, and, and Michelle Obama made the comment when, uh, when Mr. Obama first got in office, and it was, for the first time in a long time, I'm very proud of America, is what she said. Yeah. People have misunderstood that. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, people have, people have, you know, taken that to mean, why, weren't you, weren't you an American, weren't you? I was so sick of this, I, I call it chest pounding. Yeah. You know, I'm proud to be him, you know. Yeah. Here's a man who finally gets it that we are just one of many nations on yeah. the face of this earth. Yeah. You know, God created Love everybody. Us. Love us. <laughs> you know, uh, and uh, th there again is, is you, you run into that opposition, oppositional group that says, no, we need to be elite, we need to be proud. We need, yeah. and, and we need to do like what the English did before. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Precisely. Precisely. You know, um, and uh, I'm, I'm actually, I'm, I'm actually. It's like a breath of fresh air. Yeah. It's like a breath of fresh air. You know, to 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 be able just to, you know, meet someone from France or meet someone, and 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 then realize that, you know, we're not all snooty and puffed up and egotistical and arrogant. You know, that's just a certain segment of society that, yeah. that's like that. Think uh, back in the days when Miles Davis. And all those other great musicians, I mean, musicians like you look barely fine today, mm -hmm. went out to France and those places, and they were like, I get better treated out over there. Exactly. So, you know, where did, you know, where did, did things change in the attitude in people? Because that wasn't that long ago. Mm -hmm. You know, Miles Davis getting bopped upside his head when he stepped outside the yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's in New York. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Where did, you know, did we miss something? You know, what did we miss in this whole 60s, I, 70s, 80s? I, I, I think just, you know, New York has always been the melting pot, just like London is a melting pot. And I, I think, you know, there's, there's, there's been complaints about, you know, why, why do we have so much immigration? Well, it's immigration that has changed the, the heart and soul of the society. Yeah. You know, uh, my, my wife is from the Dominican Republic, right. okay, and as, as uh, more and more Hispanic people, you know, came to New York and now all the way, you know, the Carolinas all the way down the coast, mm -hmm. attitudes change because yeah. attitudes come with people. And, and, and it's refreshing that there's a variety of attitudes now. And, and, I, and I think that's, that was the key element over the years of, of just, you know, different people coming in, different yeah. people bringing their... Uh, their beliefs and their cultures and, and you know that's supposed to be what America was about you know uh, you know we have a we have a statue that France gave, France gave us out in the middle of the harbor that says you know send us your poor your tired and I have to ask myself quite often well who, who's that directed to yeah. you know who's who's 
who are you saying send us to? Yeah. You know, because that's a message that's going out to the entire world. Okay, but sometimes it doesn't seem like that's what you know certain groups are trying to say. That's right. Um, that's a hint to many things because also they should have put something else, make sure they're insured as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Before they yeah. come over. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And yeah, and so those are all topics that uh, people in the states don't necessarily even want to talk about. It just remains, you know, Tea Party ish or underground. But aren't they going to have to? They're going to have to. This is well, why I'm speaking with you about elections are showing they're going to have exactly. to. Exactly. You know. Uh, Republicans are having a real problem right now trying to get a platform to stand on because until they embrace the fact that times have changed, mm -hmm. people's attitudes have changed, uh, if they keep on running on that platform that they have, they're going to keep on losing elections. Yeah. Uh, that's bottom line. Uh, yeah. You know, folks, folks thought after one term that Mr. Obama was done. I think I know that right here. <laughs> <laughs>